So uh, I think you have heard a lot of stories about sepsis. So you think after the patient is discharged from the ICU or from the ward setup and they lived happily ever after. So this is a fairy tale story, but it is not as uh, in real life. Okay. So what about life after sepsis? So first to see it, stop it and survive it. Uh, so is that so? So I'm going to share a, a, a real patient who came to our ICU. Uh, that is Mr. G. He's a 42-year-old fisherman who came with low respiratory tract infection, managed for sepsis with multi-organ failure. And he was with us for more than two weeks and on ventilator, 10 days, non-invasive ventilation for two days. And then he was discharged to the ward. Then he was discharged to, the, uh, to his home. And... Uh, during the discharge, all parameters were stable and off all organ support because we monitor them till the patient discharged from the hospital. So then he visited our post operate uh, post ICU uh, clinic. We call it Pulse Clinic. That post ICU uh, life support and evaluation clinic. After two weeks of discharge, uh, he came with his wife. By looking at him, he was almost normal, but his wife said, wife said that he was unable to return to his job as he felt fatigability and wife noticed that he has forgetfulness. Then what did we do? So this is our pulse clinic. So it was recently opened uh, 21st of May. So it is just more than three months. So there are we did uh, we used two tools. So that is SF36. And MOCA. So SF36 stands for short form 36. So it is a tool to assess overall health status and quality of life who has survived sepsis. So it can be post ICU discharge or uh, discharge from the ward. So we can use that tool to anyone. And here it has 36 items and uh, derived into eight domains. And each domain is scored separately from 0 to 100. And summary brings two uh, summary scores, that is physical component and the mental component. So here is SF36, that is short form 36. So physical functioning is 75%. So we rate that not to 100, um, uh, we give a number. So his 75% physical functioning, which is all right. Role em elimination due to physical health is not percent. Role limitation due to emotional problem is not percent. Energy and fatigability 55%, which is remarkable. It is just above 50%. And mental health is 68%. Social functioning 12.5, which is very, very reduced. And bodily pain, he suffered a lot of pains and aches, 32.5 percentage, and general health 40%. So there is a uh, something we have to do for him. Then we uh, the, the second tool we use is Montreal. Uh, cognitive assessment. So this is a highly sensitive tool, early detection of mild cognitive impairment. So it is derived from mini mental score examination or exam. Uh, in a, And it is very sensitive in clinical setup. So it has 30 um, uh, points. So if uh, 26 to 30 is normal, 25 to 18, mild cognitive impairment, 17 to 10 is moderate cognitive impairment, and less than 10 is severe cognitive impairment. He had a score of 13 out of 30. So he had moderate cognitive impairment, which has uh, what she, he complains we could have, we can't quantify with our tools. So this is the introduction. So what are the life long term, uh, what are the long term effects of sepsis? So many sepsis survivors, the fight does not end with the hospital discharge. So it is a long, long journey. So post sepsis syndrome is the term used to describe long term physical, psychological symptoms that affect 50% of sepsis survivors. So most of the 50% of sepsis survivors within 90 days of cervical, there are hospital readmissions because of the, uh, these problems. So uh, what is the burden? So burden is about 30, 30, 20 to 30% of sepsis survivors experience from 
post sepsis syndrome. So there are physical and cognitive impairment, psychological, economical burden, and long-term outcome. Psychological, physical, and cognitive imp uh, impairment. Physical symptoms vary 50% of the sepsis survivors, and cognitive impairment 40% of sepsis survivors. And psychological impact. Mental health disorders up to 40% of sepsis survivors, mainly post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety. So most of the sepsis survivors will have, uh, if they have post-traumatic stress, uh, stress disorder, they use this, ab they abuse recreational drugs, alcohol, smoking, and their life is not as previous if they have ongoing problems. Though what is the economical bird? Healthcare cost, you know, if the patient comes to ICU, the cost is high, very high. And rehabilitation can be two to three, three times higher than that of patients without post sepsis syndrome. And loss productivity. So it is then a burden to the economy because most of these patients are breadwinners in the family. So they can't really uh, go to previous employment as well as they can't as soon as once they are discharged from the hospital they can't engage with the, their day-to-day -day work as well as the job so long-term outcome their life expectancy is lower uh, as we, when you compare with the other population and they have low quality of life so that is a burden. So what is our data from Columbus South Teaching Hospital we have limited data because it is just three months data. So we chose one one to three months data, those who came to the uh, clinic. So physical and cognitive impairment, uh, uh, physical symptoms, about 60% of sepsis survivors, cognitive impairment, 40% of sepsis uh, survivors. The, uh, so uh, with, with the time, uh, this is an ongoing study. So uh, these numbers can be changed. Psychological impairment, 10% were depressed, 20 were very anxious, but we couldn't come across post-traumatic stress disorder. Then what is the economical burden? They could not return to work within the uh, within a month of discharge. So the outcome, when they compare the quality of life before the sepsis, it was not so. So uh, it was lower than the general population. Then what are the key features? So physical effects, fatigue, weakness, and pain. So difficulty in concentration, clouded thinking, difficulty in sleeping, poor memory, and uh, difficulty in swallowing, muscle weakness, sadness, all these things were associated with that. Then memory problems as well, and the psychological effects as well. So what is the pathophysiology of post-sepsis syndrome? So post-sepsis syndrome and the post-COVID-19 syndrome has a lot of similarities. So there are some uh, management also can be used for uh, post-COVID-19 uh, survivors. So there are, we all know, there are two phases. Uh, the pro-inflammatory phases at the beginning of the sepsis. So that is un overwhelming uh, inflammation. So that is uncontrolled inflammation with organ failure, early death due to um, uh, due to um, uh, poor recognition and the poor treatment like source control as well as antibiotics. If he survives that part, then early inflammation part goes on. So as a result of increased inflammatory cytokines, that is necrosis factor alpha, uh, interleukin-6, and then damage, uh, that is immature, mon uh, immature neutrophils and um, uh, um, uh, neutrophils, so damage associated molecular pattern uh, release will cause this. Then oxidative stress and the vascular defects, example hypotension and organ failure will cause this early inflammation. Then slowly it goes to the recovery phase that is immune homeostasis. It is a new way of a new balance of immune homeostasis after that they have low immune status then with the onset of early uh, uncontrolled inflammation there is a concurrent rise concurrent depression in uh, immune immunity as well so that is early immunosuppression 
as uh, why it happens lymphocyte apoptosis cellular reprogramming especially t cell proportion increase regulatory t cell proportion increase and elevated uh, immature neutrophils and granulocytes that is myeloid derived suppressive cells then after that if uh, then if they have if they have if we have treated them properly they come to a position uh, a phase like prolonged immunosuppression they have impaired cytokine uh, secretion, epigenetic modification, dysfunctional CD4 and CD8 T cells, and there are cellular reprogramming and increased T cell uh, T regulation proportions, elevated um, immature neutrophils and granulocytes, that is myeloid derived suppressive cells. So after that, if uh, they can, uh, because 90, uh, within 90 days, they, they can have low immune state with that recurrent sepsis, uh, hospital readmissions and late death can occur. So there are two peaks, early, early death and the late death as well. So how do we diagnose post-sepsis syndrome? So that is history, examination, investigation, like any other investigation. It involves a combination of clinical assessment and evaluation of symptoms that persist after an episode of sepsis. Clinical history, sepsis history, duration, onset is important, as well as their comorbidity and the frailty before that uh, is important. So symptom evaluation. Or of their physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and psychological symptoms, we need to assess. Then there are tests and the assessment, um, and there are laboratory tests from full blood count to imaging. Uh, it varies. And the cognitive tests, like we can use uh, short form uh, form uh, 36 as a tool, as well as Montreal uh, cognitive assessment uh, as a tool. And then exclusion of other conditions also important because they have to have the history of sepsis and then uh, sepsis related complications and the assessment of functional impact we need to do. Then how do we manage symptom management like, like physical symptoms, pain and fatigability, muscle and joint pain, cognitive rehabilitation and medication, psychological counseling and medication. Then it is a very important to rehabilitate and support it with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Medical management, regulatory monitoring and management of comorbidities other than uh, newly developed comorbidities and already existing comorbidities. And then lifestyle modification is very important. Proper nutrition, exercise, and sleep. Then patient education as the education of the family is important. And then support groups. Still, we couldn't do it in our clinic because we want to do like alcohol anonymous uh, support group. Um, and then coordination of care with multidisciplinary team and care plan and monitoring and follow-up, regular assessment and long-term planning. So the approach should be multidisciplinary. So prognosis and late out uh, and long-term outcome, it is widely based on the initial severity and frailty of the patient and follow-up. So physical health, recovery and de uh, degree of organ dysfunction is important, cognitive function and impairment, and the mental health, what is the psych psychological impact, emotional well-being and quality of life, and functional recovery and whether they can uh, be uh, occupied in the previous uh, occupation. Then what are the future directions in post-sepsis uh, syndrome? Because early death, if patient survives with early death, then post-sepsis syndrome is a, uh, like it's a lethal feedback loop if you don't address. So the immune dysfunction, cognitive deficits, and the cardiovascular TB disease associated with the immune dysfunction, if epigenetic reprogramming, T cell dysfunction is important. With that, they have low grade inflammation and immunosuppression state and cognitive deficits because of the blood brain barrier breakdown as a uh, brain ischemia as a result of uh, 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 DVT and all this, and the memory def deficits and post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. And cardiovascular and kidney disease, the main uh, feature is that mitochondrial dysfunction that is go together in cardiovascular as well as uh, renal dysfunctions. They can end up with myocardial infarction and chronic, chronic kidney disease. 
then it is important to do look after cardiovascular health while physiotherapy statin use is very useful and then risk management of cardiovascular system is important then improve mental health with uh, help of cognitive behavioral therapy and forceps training of healthcare workers from the icu itself if they are in icu keeping an icu diary is important and then prevention, use of prophylactic antibiotics, vaccination, minimum use of invasive device, and low uh, uh, avoid using immunosuppressive therapy is important. So, what are the future, ther future therapies? So, those are uh, immune modulation, that is epigenetic modulation with T cells restoration. Then mitochondrial damage prevention, use of antioxidants is important, that is reactive oxygen species and mitochondrial biogenesis is important. The other therapies like in, 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 inhibit DAMP, that is DAMP is damage associated molecular patterns, example that is a high mobility group box 1 pair protein and mitochondrial stem cell therapy and endotype stratification, so those are still in research uh, status. So. Well, uh, the recovery, we have to do the health span, quality of life, comorbidity, and reduce mortality. So these are the questions you have to answer. Um, uh, that is your take home. Uh, that is the uh, take home questions you need to answer regarding the post-sepsis syndrome. Uh, thank you.